coming to you all the way from Liverpool in England, where the Super Nerds UK podcast. And you're listening to California Dreaming on the Orbital Jigsaw Network. Warning. This episode contains details of multiple violent murders, including the killing of young children, and is not suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Also, this is the second part of a two-part series. If you haven't listened to episode 15, then you might want to pause this and listen to part one of the tale of the McStay family first, then come back to this. On the last episode, I talked probably more than I needed to about the television show on investigation discovery disappeared. This two-part series is about one of those disappearances, the McStay family. In part one, we discuss the circumstances surrounding the disappearance of the family of four and the timeline leading up to the last time they were seen. We talked a little bit about the investigation and the early theories that led investigators in the wrong direction at first. And how the case grew cold. Now, in part two, I'm going to take you through some of the rumors and the conjecture swirling around the people involved. And finally, the break in the case that finally got investigators on the right track. In today's episode of California Dreaming, The Tale of the McStay Family, part two. I want to take a moment to talk about Summer McStay, I remember revisiting this case several years ago, looking on Reddit, which I don't like to do very often, but it can get you going on some crazy theories. The case had taken an odd twist when suspicion began to be cast upon Summer McStay as possibly having a hand in the disappearance of her family. Theories about what happened began to center around the mysterious Summer McStay for a couple of reasons including an apparent shady past and her family's alleged financial troubles. Summer had also changed her name several times during the course of her life. Her maiden name was Virginia Lisa Aranda, but she had also gone by the name Summer Martelli, Summer Aranda Martelli, Lisa Aranda, Lisa Martelli, and Lisa Aranda Martelli. Martelli was her stepfather's last name, though not her own legal last name. What's even stranger is after the McStays went missing, Summer's mother-in-law discovered that Summer was actually 11 years older than she claimed to be. Summer's reasons for changing her name and age remain unclear, although in an interview with Disappeared, her sister stated that it was something that Summer wanted to choose for herself, although it seems she never really did disclose to any of her surviving friends and family why she changed her name. This left many people, web sleuths, delving into the family's disappearance especially, wondering if she was hiding from someone. There had also been rumors going around the internet that Summer was possibly trying to poison Joseph. He had been experiencing some random bouts of illness before his disappearance, including symptoms of vertigo. While his family attributed these symptoms to stress, others pointed at poisoning as the possible reason for his health issues. Joseph's business associate, Chase Merritt, also publicly claimed that Joseph told him in confidence that he believed his wife was poisoning him. Chase Merritt, as it would turn out, is not the most credible source of information. But with the onset of sudden illness Joseph McStay was experiencing, it was quite possible someone was trying to poison him. Stories also began circulating that Summer may have been struggling with anger issues and a foul temper. While Joseph's father vehemently denied that Summer would harm his son, he had publicly admitted that his daughter-in-law was very possessive of Joseph. In addition, someone used the family's home computer to search for homeopathic anger management medication 
the very same day that the family disappeared. Speculation was that her anger somehow contributed to the family's disappearance. Perhaps she got into an angry confrontation with the killer? Then there was the story about a former Marine named Vic Johansson, an ex-boyfriend of Summer's. She actually met Joseph while she was still involved in a relationship with Johansson, who apparently had a history of violent behavior. In the past, he had pleaded no contest to misdemeanor charges after threatening to kill a 12-year-old neighbor. Johansson remained in contact with Summer after their breakup, and they occasionally emailed one another. Patrick McStay had claimed that Johansson remained obsessed with Summer, even after her marriage to Joseph, continually claiming that Summer was his soulmate. His name continued to float around as a possible person of interest, and it would continue to do so as the case progressed. I was a bit more curious about this Vic Johansson character. Who was this guy and why is he threatening to kill a 12-year-old neighbor? I dug a little deeper into the aspect of this story. Summer Martelli met Joseph McStay in 2004 while she was living with her then boyfriend Johansson in the Southern California mountain community of Big Bear Lake in a home that records show he purchased in 2002. Email correspondences indicated that Summer met Joseph and became pregnant with her first son, Gianni, while she was living in Big Bear in 2004. Johansson added Summer's name to the property records associated with the Big Bear Lake home in January of 2005. He quit claiming the home to Summer a year later in January of 2006. Court records reveal that Johansson made criminal threats against a neighbor and her 12-year-old daughter in 2004 while Summer was living there. In an interview, the neighbor requested that she not be identified, but provided a detailed description of the incident in a restraining order declaration which stated, On April 20th, 2004, I was standing in front of my dining room window facing my driveway when I saw a person with bleached blonde hair pass by and head for my backyard. I went to my sliding window off of my living room and opened the door to see this defendant walking up on my patio deck. He started taking off a dog run leash that he had loaned us months ago. It was hooked around two trees next to my deck. As he was on my patio deck to take off the cable off the trees and was looking at me and yelling, I'm going to kill your son over and over and over. And then he said, I'm going to kill you and your daughter. I told him that my son doesn't live here anymore, and he said, you better stay away from my house. As he was going to the other tree to finish taking down the dog run, he was shaking a one and a half foot metal pipe yelling, I'm going to kill you, your son, and your daughter. I was a Marine, and I know how to kill. As he was leaving my backyard, he was still yelling, I'm going to kill you, your daughter, and your son, over and over. In the court papers, the neighbor also described another alleged stalking incident involving Johansson. My daughter and her two friends were walking down the street when they passed Vic Johansson's house. He walked out with his dog and followed the girls very closely. As the girls got scared and walked faster, he also walked faster. The girls called me on their cell phone and they were crying and shaking because they were frightened that Vic was going to hurt them. My son went into the Marine Corps at Camp Pendleton, San Diego, California. Now my 12-year-old daughter and myself are alone in our house and have fear that Vic Johansson might keep coming by our house and harassing us, or he might follow my daughter again while she walks by his house on her way to and from school. Big Bear Lake Sheriff's deputies arrested Johansson on April 20, 2004, and he was charged in San Bernardino Superior Court with one misdemeanor count of making criminal threats. Johansson, at the time age 27, pleaded no contest to the misdemeanor charge on May 5, 2004, and received probation. 
The judge ordered Johansson to attend a 24-week anger management program and served him with a restraining order to keep him away from his neighbor and her children. He was given credit for six days already served in jail. On June 29, 2004, a judge issued a bench warrant for Johansson's arrest when he failed to enroll in the anger management program. Probation was reinstated on August 12, 2004. Another bench warrant was issued on September 30, 2004, when Johansson failed to appear in court. Probation was reinstated again on November 30, 2004. Johansson completed the anger management program on December 15, 2004, according to a report filed with the court. Over the years, Johansson kept in contact with Summer McStay, even after her marriage to Joseph McStay and the birth of their sons, Gianni and Joey, according to family email records. Johansson wrote this email to Summer in September of 2005. Summer, I am sincerely happy for you and your family. I am proud of you. I assure you I am a true friend of your family. You can still call me if you ever need help with anything. Don't forget about me. I'm still out here. I genuinely care about your well-being and all of those that you love. Friendship can be the most beautiful of true love. The trials of life will always reveal the truth. I believe in you, Summer. Don't forget. I truly believe in you. Knowing you're out there gives me faith in the world. Knowing that you are blessed with a child shows me that your beauty is blossoming in the world. All of my heart goes to you, Summer Girl, forever. He also wrote this email on December 23, 2009, six weeks before the family's disappearance. I love you forever. Happy birthday, Summer. Forever and ever, Vic. To Patrick McStay, the fact that Summer had an old boyfriend contacting her via email was reason for concern. Well, he's got a violent background, said Patrick McStay, referring to Johansson's criminal threat conviction. If I'm a cop, I'm going to look at this guy seriously. I'm going to run down everything I can about him. Where was he? What was he doing? Who's he associating with? What's going on? said Patrick McStay. As it turns out, Johansson had moved from Big Bear Lake to San Clemente by the time the McStay family went missing. At 1.10 a.m. on January 10, 2010, deputies arrested Johansson on charges of interfering with the business and resisting a peace officer after he refused to leave the O.C. Tavern according to an Orange County jail booking record. The O.C. Tavern is directly next door to an office building that Joseph McStay had leased to operate his fountain business, Earth Inspired Products. At the time of Johansson's arrest, however, it appears McStay had already moved out of his office. Johansson gave Orange County deputies his address when he was booked into jail for the 2010 arrest that was about two miles from the San Clemente home that Joseph and Summer McStay had rented prior to their move to Fallbrook. The resulting misdemeanor complaint charged Johansson with one count of interfering with the business. Defendant unlawfully refused to leave the premises of the business establishment after being requested to leave by the owner's agent. The charging document said, Johansson pleaded guilty he was sentenced to one year probation, given credit for three days in custody, ordered to stay away from the OC Tavern, and was required to provide a DNA sample, the court records said. Officers arrested Johansson in October on a vandalism charge for allegedly breaking out a door window of a bar in Mammoth Lakes. A Mono County Superior Court official told CBS News 8 that Johansson, 36 by now, is a known transient veteran in the small mountain community. Johansson's criminal history in Mono County also includes a felony vandalism conviction in August of 2011 when he destroyed an $800 computer during an altercation with roommates and a misdemeanor disturbing the peace conviction in June of 2013 when he threatened a 
teller at a Bank of America. His probation was revoked in July of 2013 when Johansson allegedly returned to the same Bank of America branch in violation of a court order. In 2011, Patrick McStay urged San Diego County Sheriff's Department detectives to investigate Johansson's background, one of many leads they failed to follow, according to the elder McStay. Well, as it would turn out, despite all of the criminal activity of Summer's ex-boyfriend, there will be no case against him. The investigating detectives had their sights set somewhere else, and... It's a pretty good lead that doesn't involve Johansson. But it takes some time to get there. And as the case makes its way through the system, Johansson's name had been likely to come up as a possible suspect in the disappearance of the mixed days. Detectives are just going to have to do their work. Despite everything swirling around in Summer's background, there was no denying that she and Joseph were according to all that knew them, absolutely crazy in love with one another. They were introduced by a mutual friend in 2004, and according to that friend, it was love at first sight, and it was obvious to everyone that they had an instant connection. Gianni was born in 2005, and less than two years later, Joseph Jr. arrived. A few months after they had Joseph Jr., the couple married at a small, intimate wedding in Orange County, California. But something strange happened that always kind of stuck out in Joseph's mother's mind. None of Summer's side of the family attended the wedding. The night before the ceremony, Summer had called all of her family and told them not to show up. Joseph's mother inquired with him about his wife's family, like, what's going on? Why can't we get together? But her son just kind of brushed her off. This was an aspect of Summer that spoke to some of the issues the couple may have been facing within their relationship. Joseph, too, also had some issues in his background as well, specifically his first marriage. In his early 20s, Joseph was married to a young woman named Heather, and together they had a son, their young romance broke down after about six years of marriage, and it was a devastating turn in Joseph's life. According to family, Heather was the love of his life. She filed for divorce in 1998, citing irreconcilable differences. The young parents chose to share custody of their son, Jonah, and despite some reports of Summer being quite jealous of her husband's first wife, she apparently welcomed Jonah with open arms into their new family. And with all of these backstories regarding Summer, at the time the family disappeared, there really weren't any indications the couple were looking to take off for an unplanned extended vacation. Everything was moving forward and in the right direction for the couple. The new home, the bustling indoor water feature business, and two boys to raise. Everybody loved Joseph. The boys were full of life. And Summer was a fabulous mom. No one would have expected them to simply vanish into thin air. The elder mixed day, Patrick, as I had stated, worked tirelessly to investigate the disappearances of Joseph, Summer, Gianni, and Joseph Jr. He figured if he could find one of them, he would find all of them. With San Diego detectives seemingly sold on that they walked into Mexico theory and all the rumors swirling around summer, Patrick McStay pressed forward to find the truth. All the while, there was one person Mr. McStay remained somewhat suspicious of. Somebody that nobody was really talking about that much. Chase Merritt. As far as Patrick was concerned, he knew Merritt was a business associate of his son's, as well as someone Joseph considered a friend. He had even told his dad that if he were to ever meet Merritt, he would like him. He's a good guy. Let's talk a little bit more about Mr. Chase Merritt and how he plays into all this. Who is this man? 
And what, if anything, did he know about the disappearance of the McStay family? First off, Chase Merritt, in the media, and to anyone who would listen, would be the first one to disparage Summer, which struck me as kind of an odd way to act towards someone who has gone missing. In an interview with CNN, he publicly contradicted what family and friends had said about Summer's feelings about Joseph's son from his first marriage. He stated that Summer hated the fact that Jonah was around, taking her husband's time away from herself and her two boys, and also said he couldn't say whether she liked Jonah or not, but that she really didn't act like she did. He went on to say that she was very egotistical and that she pretty much thought she was better than everybody else and that she could do no wrong and that Joseph could do better. He also said that Joseph simply put up with Summer's controlling behavior because he loved her, despite the problems. Merritt claims Joseph confided in him about their problems. Now, right off the bat, this guy rubbed me the wrong way. Even with his first statement, I'm recounting that he made on national television about the missing mother, wife of his supposed good friend. I mean, seriously, if he's going to go on CNN to speak about his knowledge of the case, what in the world would his opinion of Summer's feelings towards Jonah even have to be a part of the conversation? Right away, it struck me as self-serving and somewhat blame-deflecting. Also in the interview, Merritt claims that Joseph confided in him about his health issues, including bouts of extreme dizziness, nausea, and that Joseph went to the doctor several times, but they couldn't find anything wrong with him. Merritt goes on to say that Joseph openly wondered if maybe his own wife were potentially to blame for these health problems, and that Joseph told him another friend suggested that maybe he should stop eating at home. When Merritt was asked if he thought Joseph suspected his wife was trying to poison him, he answered that Joseph said that maybe he should take heed. When Merritt was asked what the motive would be that Summer would ever want to consider poisoning Joseph, Merritt states that they never talked about it. For a period of time, even Patrick McStay entertained the idea that Summer was poisoning his son because of his health problems. But... He quickly put those rumors to rest in his own mind. And neither does Joseph's mom, mainly because she's gone too. Something has happened to the both of them and their children. Any inclination that Summer was trying to harm Joseph quickly faded away as soon as they all disappeared. Merritt's theories that Summer might have had something to do with the family's disappearance may seem a little far-fetched but there were in fact some signs that the marriage was experiencing some troubles. A few weeks before the family vanished, Joseph wanted to seek out a family counselor. He reached out to his mom to help him find someone who he said he wanted to help get his family back on track. His mom stated that they were finally able to find one at the end of January. That seemed like someone who would be able to be a good fit for the family, but they never ended up seeing the counselor. Four days into February, they were gone. The last person known to have seen Joseph McStay alive just also happens to be the same individual who had been attempting to divert attention on the case on December McStay, the one who had the lunch meeting with Joseph earlier in the afternoon the same day that the family disappeared, the one who knew how to get into the McStay home through an open window when every other door and window was locked. The one who Joseph's cell phone made its very last unanswered call to. One, Chase Merritt. Joseph drove to meet with Merritt at Chick-fil-A in Rancho Cucamonga around noon on February 4th. According to Merritt, he and Joseph had a lot to talk about, apparently in regards to business, and that the business was booming, and this was according to Merritt. He said that they had approximately 500 waterfalls that were on order to be manufactured, and Merritt was one of the people who helped Joseph build them. After lunch, they spoke on the phone a handful more times, so when Merritt's phone rang at 8.28 p.m. that same night, and he saw that it was Joseph, 
He didn't answer because he said he was tired. This would be the last known call from Joseph's cell phone. The call was made 41 minutes after the neighbor's surveillance camera captured the mixed days as Zuzu Trooper leaving the neighborhood. Investigators wondered if it was truly Joseph that made that 8.28 p.m. call to Merritt, or if someone else had Joseph's phone and made that call, or was Joseph trying to call for help? Nobody could be quite sure. That missed call might have very well been a missed opportunity, one of several in the mysterious vanishing of the mixed days. Merritt claims that the next day, he tried to call Joseph a couple of times but got no answer and says he began to become concerned by the end of the second day when he hadn't heard word from Joseph. This would be Saturday, February 6th. Dan Cavanaugh was Joseph's web designer at the time he went missing. He ran the company's website and after he hadn't heard from Joseph for a few days, he began to feel uneasy about it too. They communicated constantly about business, and furthermore, he couldn't get a hold of Summer either. He decided to get in contact with Patrick to share his concerns with Joseph's dad. He just had this gut instinct, this bad feeling, that when someone like Joseph, who was always so easy to get in touch with, wasn't getting in touch, something was very wrong. On February 9th, Five days since anyone heard from the mixed days, Patrick called Joseph's younger brother, Michael, who lived near Joseph, and told him that he needed to go down right away and check on his brother. Michael blew his dad off, telling him he's too busy. Michael was thinking at the time that his dad was overreacting and that there had to be a perfectly logical explanation for his brother kind of being off the grid for a few days. Of course, Michael couldn't have known what was actually going on with his brother and his family. But those lost days, those days that passed where nobody was checking in on the missing family were very critical days. Patrick got a hold of the local law enforcement and requested a wellness check on the family. And they did, but they only looked around the outside of the house, knocked on the doors and got no answers. They peered in the windows and really saw nothing amiss and left. However, Mr. Chase Merritt decided to make his way over to the house as well, apparently to check things out for himself. And he says he didn't see anything suspicious either, but he did let Joseph's mother know that the dogs were left outside. She called Michael right away to let him know what Merritt found, so he decided he needed to go to the house himself, finally. So on February 13th, Michael drove to his brother's house and Merritt met him there. Together, they climbed into an unlocked window, the very one that Merritt seemed to have advanced knowledge of. They found the house in disarray, with rotten food on the counter, popcorn spilled on the sofa, and clothes thrown all over the place. It was at this point that Merritt suggested to Michael that he get in touch with the San Diego Sheriff's Department But Michael, again, did not want to overreact. He wanted to wait until the end of the weekend, still convinced that his brother could have likely taken a vacation. If you're thinking what I'm thinking, how could they look at the condition of the house and surmise that they just packed up for an extended vacation, right? Food left out rotting, dogs left out in the yard, not notifying anyone as to where they're going, and not being in touch with anyone in the family? You know and I know that we watch and listen to enough true crime to know that something is wrong and we'd be on the horn with law enforcement quickly. But apparently Joseph's brother doesn't watch Investigation Discovery, Dateline, 2020, or 48 Hours. Otherwise, his red flags would have gone up immediately too. But they didn't, and he didn't seem to think anything was wrong from the state of the home either. So, Monday, February 15th, 11 days since anyone had heard from the McStay family, Michael finally called the sheriff's station to report his brother's family missing. Sheriffs arrived at the scene and they contacted the homicide division per their policy that when someone goes missing, if it's more than 10 days, they put homicide investigators on the case. But for some inexplicable reason, 
The San Diego sheriffs don't seal off the home as a crime scene. They didn't put up any crime scene tape, and they didn't put up any notices on the door to not enter. They locked the doors and went to get search warrants. This didn't make any sense to the family and friends of the mixed days, but anyway, it took San Diego law enforcement four days to obtain the warrants they needed to search the house. So in the meantime, Joseph's mother, Susan, called the sheriff's department and asked if she had permission to go into the home, and they said she did. So she went over there and cleaned up the kitchen and took out all the trash, and it was full of dirty diapers that had been sitting there for almost two weeks, so you can imagine the smell. At the same time, other family members and friends were looking through papers and through the computer, trying to find any kind of evidence as to where the family may have gone. Michael even took the computers and the SD cards from the house and searched through everything, and he was told it was okay for him to do so as long as he put the stuff back in the house by the time they were ready to serve the search warrants. Patrick, of course, all the way over in Texas, couldn't do anything. He knew that key evidence was being compromised the more the house was being cleaned and searched through, and the longer it took for investigators to start their own searches, the worse it was going to be. I really don't like to throw shade at law enforcement agencies. I appreciate the work they do for the communities they serve, but man, I don't know how the San Diego Sheriff's Department allowed for this to happen at the mixed day home. Things that could have led to any kind of information as to where the family had been gone, potentially crucial evidence had been touched, moved, cleaned, and thrown out for good. So then began a trail of evidence that led investigators in their search for the mixed day family in the wrong direction. On the 15th, the day the mixed days were reported missing, San Diego investigators issued a be on the lookout alert for the missing Isuzu trooper and immediately got a hit on the vehicle. They found out that on February 8th, The family SUV was parked and subsequently towed from a parking lot steps away from the Mexican border. The vehicle also yielded no evidence of foul play either, no indications of a struggle, and no blood. The children's car seats were securely in place in the back seat. Family and investigators were left wondering, did the McStays park their vehicle and vanish into Mexico for some reason? Michael McStay begins thinking, okay, so they're in Cabo San Lucas? They're vacationing on the beach? Is this where they've traveled to? He's again stuck on this idea that his brother and his family are on an extended vacation, and his mother thinking the same thing might be a possibility. But I think they were just hoping. But it didn't make any sense to the elder McStay, Patrick. He wasn't buying it. He knew Summer wasn't interested in traveling to Mexico, and he was certain she would not take her two children to vacation there. But the family vehicle being parked near the border wasn't the only clue leading investigators to think that they had crossed into Mexico. They found the Google searches on the family computer about traveling into Mexico and passports for children. So, to them, travel to Mexico wasn't out of the question for the missing family. Then, a few weeks later, after poring over hours and hours of video surveillance at the border crossing, investigators spotted what appeared to be a family of four matching the McStay's general description crossing over into the border of Mexico on February 8th, shortly after the time the Azuzu had been parked in the parking lot nearby. And with that, it seemed the San Diego investigators assigned to the McStay case were pretty convinced that the family had vanished on their own by crossing the border into Mexico. Patrick, again, was not having any of this. He was convinced the San Diego investigators were wrong, and he needed some serious help getting the investigation on the right track. He contacted fellow Texan Tim Miller, the founder of Texas EquiSearch. Now, If you're like me and you watch and listen to a great deal of true crime programming, then you are familiar with EquiSearch. But in case you're not, I'll tell you a little bit about the nonprofit organization. According to its website, 
Texas EquiSearch, spelled E-Q-U-U-S-E-A-R-C-H, Mounted Search and Recovery Team, was started in August of 2000 with the purpose to provide volunteer horse-mounted search and recovery for lost and missing persons. The team was started in the North Galveston County area because of a high incidence of missing persons in the largely undeveloped area of South Harris and North Galveston counties. With this in mind, the team's existence and purpose is dedicated to the memory of Laura Miller, the daughter of founding director Tim Miller. Laura was abducted and murdered in North Galveston County in 1984. The team is comprised of volunteers of various experiences, with many being experienced horse owners. They currently have approximately 600 plus members and are growing rapidly and are currently available to conduct searches nationwide and worldwide. They are a 501c3 nonprofit organization and are funded solely by donations. Many of its members are trained in various rescue and life-saving skills, such as CPR, advanced life-saving skills, and field craft. Their members come from all walks of life, consisting of business owners, medics, firefighters, housewives, electricians, students, former FBI and law enforcement, former and current U.S. Marshals, Coast Guards, and all branches of the military, former and current, are part of the team. Their resources range from horse and rider teams to foot searches and ATVs. They conduct water searches using boats, divers, and sonar equipment. Additionally, they perform air searches using planes, helicopters, and small drones with highly sophisticated cameras. They have also utilized infrared and night vision cameras, along with ground penetration units in many of their searches. Texas EquiSearch has more resources than most law enforcement agencies, which allows law enforcement to conduct their investigation while Texas EquiSearch conducts organized searches. This has led to an excellent working relationship between law enforcement and Texas EquiSearch team, which has resulted in the team being contacted regularly by agencies across the nation to assist them in their missing persons cases. Texas EquiSearch has been involved in over 1,350 searches in 42 states, as well as in Aruba, Sri Lanka, Mexico, Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua. The team has helped in returning over 300 missing people home safely to their families and recovering the remains of 159 missing loved ones, with at no time having any of the searches resulted in evidence being compromised by the team for future criminal prosecution. Needless to say, Texas EquiSearch has quite the reputation, which is exactly why Mr. McStay reached out to them when his loved ones went missing. The first place Tim Miller went was the McStay home. Michael McStay let them in. Still baffled that they were allowed to go in and out of the home of the missing family, Tim Miller didn't really see anything that led him to believe that there was any foul play that took place at the home. But what he was sure of is that the family didn't leave with the intentions of never coming back. One thing that really stood out to him is the double stroller. If anyone out there has multiple children close in age, as the McStays had two toddler-aged children, they really don't go anywhere, especially on vacation, without their double stroller which was still sitting there in the home. After leaving the mixed day house, Tim was convinced, like Patrick had been all along, that something terrible had happened to the family of four. So the next day they drove down to the border to look around for any areas that looked suspicious. The area of San Diego that is near the border is so vast, a dry desert type of land with many hills and mountains. Searching it would be a daunting task. But as soon as Tim Miller was told about the surveillance camera images of the family of four walking across the border, he decided to call off any plans for a ground search. He thought there was a great possibility that was the McStay family in the video. 
and he was not going to be able to justify a massive search of the area with that possibility lingering. The possibility that they crossed the border voluntarily. That, and with law enforcement having been so adamant that they had gone to Mexico, there had even been a sighting of the family in Mexico, supposedly a waiter that had served the family cocktails, insisting that it was a missing family. And this waiter was certain of this because he mistook Joseph Jr. as a girl because of his long hair and asked if he had bumped his head because of a prominent birthmark on his forehead. This even further convinced San Diego investigators the family went south of the border. That was going to be their story, and they were sticking to it. And with that, the case of the missing mixed days grew cold. Eventually, San Diego investigators handed the case over to the FBI in April of 2013. And then, the mystery deepened. On November 11, 2013, at 9.58 a.m., a call came in to 911 from a motorcyclist off-roading in the Mojave Desert. He had discovered a part of a human skull in Victorville, California, a remote area 100 miles north of the McStay family home and 150 miles north of the Mexican border. San Bernardino County law enforcement immediately convened in the area where the skull was found and eventually discovered two shallow graves with four skeletons. Dental records confirmed that these were the remains of Joseph, Summer, Gianni, and Joseph Jr. McStay. With the discovery of the remains, the mystery of the McStay family was going to finally move this case from being a cold missing persons case to a murder investigation. Their case was promptly handed over to the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department. As you can imagine, the family was openly critical of San Diego investigators for overlooking evidence that could have led to the McStays having been found sooner. It seems they decided that the McStays were indefinitely vacationing in Mexico and seemingly quit looking elsewhere. San Diego investigators, with thousands of pages in their McStay file, insisted that they followed up on every lead as thoroughly as possible. It seems that, from the outside looking in, common sense would dictate that the family going to Mexico wasn't really plausible. Why would they park their car and walk into Mexico? Why wouldn't they just drive in? Why would they go at that time of the evening in November? It's dark. There really isn't anything to do on the other side of the border, especially at night with small children. And considering the timing of everything, the family's Isuzu found parked between 5 p.m. and 5.30 p.m., but their surveillance video of the family of four walking into Mexico is time-stamped 7 p.m. What about those two hours? The McStays weren't seen anywhere else on any other cameras in the parking lot or in any of the shops in the mall adjacent to the parking lot. What it comes down to is this. The person who parked the car there in the parking lot fooled everyone. That person wanted family, friends, and investigators to think the McStays went to Mexico, and it worked. San Diego investigators despite the family having been found in Victorville, continue to stand by their belief that they did indeed go into Mexico that day. And whatever happened to them happened after they crossed back into the United States. However, there is no record of any of the mixed days having been checked in at the border, so nobody else really believes, including me, that they were ever in Mexico, except San Diego police. Two days after the remains were found, the case was officially handed over to San Bernardino investigators. It became their job to try and figure out who would do this to the mixed days and why. Their biggest hurdle? Lost time. Time between them having gone missing and being recovered in the desert. 
time that evidence would be forever lost to the elements and animal activity. The time between the person who did this and where they would be after nearly four years. The task would be daunting. The investigation went on for about a year. They tracked down all those possible leads I talked about earlier. Summer's possible involvement, her ex-boyfriend, even family and friends were investigated. However, after eliminating all other possible persons of interest, the investigation finally led to the arrest of one man, Chase Merritt, the very person who had been Joseph's close friend and business partner. He even described him as his best friend. The one who helped the family out in the early stages of the investigation. The one who had gone on an interview on CNN and basically pointed his finger at Summer. That Chase Merritt. On November 5, 2014, almost a year after the discovery of the remains of the McStay family in those shallow graves in the Mojave Desert, Merritt was arrested and charged with four counts of first-degree capital murder, making the case against him a death penalty case. This turn of events, the arrest of Joseph's business partner and supposed best friend, how does one go from that to being accused of murdering him and his entire family? What in the world could possibly be the motive for this, especially the children, a three and four year old? The business partner, okay, I get it, things happen, a falling out, a business dispute, a breakdown in the relationship. We've heard of such things happening. Okay, and you've got to get rid of the witnesses, right? This means the wife has to go too, but the kids? Not that any of this is in any way justifiable, but the killing of those babies is absolutely unconscionable. And wait until I get to how this man accused of this crime did it. This was a very personal, angry act of murder perpetrated upon this family. How did Joseph come to know this Chase Merritt? Well, as it turns out, Joseph always wanted to be an entrepreneur. He wanted to run his own business and be his own boss. He had this idea one day while he was working at a gift shop that he managed. The gift shop sold these indoor water features and waterfalls. He figured he could make these himself and do it cost effectively, build his own business and turn a nice profit, and he did. He would spend maybe $20 on materials, build the thing, and turn around and sell it for $250. Thus, Joseph's business, Earth Inspired Products, was born. He decided to build these custom water features in his own home and sell them online, and before he knew it, his business was flourishing. He had one business partner who ran the sales online and kept the website up and running and he subcontracted out some of the work as there was more and more demand for his waterfalls. This is when Joseph met Merritt, who also manufactured custom indoor waterfalls, and Joseph would purchase them from him for his business. Together, they were expecting over a million dollar in sales for 2010. Aside from business, the two became very close friends, often having dinner with each other's families at least a couple times a week. It's probably no surprise that eventually Merritt began experiencing some financial troubles, and Joseph, being the good friend that he was, was more than happy to help his friend out by loaning him money. Joseph's web designer, Dan Cavanaugh, who ran the online business and kept the books, told CNN in an interview that he kept an Excel spreadsheet that maintained the balance of what Merritt owed Joseph. Merritt would ask for loans against future work with promises that Joseph could take whatever Merritt owed him out of the sale of the next fountain to the tune of upwards of $20,000 or more. According to Merritt, the debt that he owed to Joseph was never an issue between the two, but others would say it was most definitely a problem, especially if there was a customer who was dissatisfied with the quality of work of a particular waterfall and it had to be redone or fixed or completely refunded 
it would be Joseph that would be on the hook financially for it because Merit had already pocketed his share of the profits in advance. By the time Joseph and his family disappeared, Joseph had lost approximately $100,000 worth of mistakes. Mistakes that were made on the part of Merit and his shoddy work or use of cheap or subpar materials in the manufacturing process. Work that Merit had already been paid for. Losses for which Joseph was made to take 100%. Other business associates of Joseph grew so concerned about Merit, they began to warn him that Merit was not on the up and up in regards to the quality of his work. There had even been instances that a customer had paid for a water feature, Merit was paid for the work, and the customer never received what they had ordered. Joseph's associates were afraid of the severe damage to the reputation of the company because of Merritt's substandard business and work ethic. Joseph heard what they had to say, but he was certain he was able to handle his dealings with Merritt. He wasn't concerned at all about him, and he kind of blew off the concerns that were raised. Unfortunately, as far as San Bernardino authorities were concerned, Joseph's associates were right. Chase Merritt was bad news, the worst news imaginable. Merritt's arrest came in just under a year after the remains of the McStay family were discovered buried in the Mojave Desert. Merritt had been on investigators' radar since the time of their disappearance, and once their remains were discovered, the case could finally be considered a full-blown quadruple murder investigation. One of the main pieces of evidence investigators uncovered is Merritt's DNA having been identified inside the McStay vehicle that had been abandoned at the Mexican border from the steering wheel and the gear shift handle. Merritt had told investigators that he had never driven the vehicle. In addition to the DNA evidence, Merritt was further connected to the crime through cell phone towers. There were five calls he made from his cell phone on February 6, 2010, two days after the family were last seen alive, that pinged a tower in Victorville, near where the family was buried. And they were buried very close to where Merritt's sister had been living at the time. The prosecution's theory is that Merritt killed the McStay family, not only because of debts he owed to Joseph, but also for financial gain beyond that. They alleged that Merritt had a gambling addiction, that he was heavily in debt, and that from the day that the family was last seen alive on February 4th, 2010 through February 8th, 2010, Merritt wrote multiple checks exceeding $21,000 on Joseph's online business account. Merritt frequently gambled at Indian casinos in Temecula and San Bernardino and at the Commerce Casino in the Los Angeles area, losing thousands of dollars. So, I've told you the who, the where, and the why, but now I'm going to tell you the how. You may find this difficult to listen to, especially since this had been perpetrated against two young children. The autopsies concluded that the entire family had been beaten to death with a blunt object, and the investigators believe the murder weapon to be a three pound Stanley brand sledgehammer that was found in the grave in which Summer was buried with one of her sons. Given the extent of the injuries inflicted on the McStay family, at least what could be determined based on the skeletal remains is that they were tortured before they died, with indications that they were beaten repeatedly in the head, legs, arms, and torso. The cause of death for all four members of the McStay family had been ruled blunt force trauma to the head. There were at least four impacts to the skull of Joseph McStay and at least seven impacts to the head of four-year-old Gianni McStay. The skeletal remains of Joseph were found with a cut-off extension cord wrapped around his neck and the rest of his body wrapped in a white material and all of it secured with a tie-down strap. Some of the clothing that was found buried with Summer had paint on it, 
that matched the paint that was being applied to the inside of their new home, lending to the fact that she had been working on painting when all of this happened. The theory is that the family was killed inside their home. And if that was the case, then the fact that the home hadn't been thoroughly searched and treated as a crime scene back when this was a missing persons case is a very troubling aspect of the case against Merritt. The house was in disarray to begin with because of the move, and investigators did not conduct any kind of forensic search for evidence such as blood splatter, which may have led the investigation in the right direction much earlier. The house has since undergone renovations, so much of what might have been there in terms of forensic evidence is likely gone, unfortunately. If there is anything there, then it should come out at trial. However, other evidence points to this having happened inside the mixed day home are items found in the graves, such as painter's tape, shop towels, and the sledgehammer smeared with paint matching the paint from the home. All of these things appeared to have come from the mixed day house. Also, the item that Joseph was found wrapped in appeared to be a futon cover that was missing from the home. Additionally, while all the victim's clothing was found in the graves, no shoes were found, which is another indication that they were at home when they were attacked. Merritt's trial for the murders of the mixed day family has been repeatedly delayed due to him repeatedly firing his attorneys and attempting to represent himself. As of today, he's gone through five attorneys in July of this year, his trial date was tentatively set to begin September 25th. But on August 25th, a San Bernardino Superior Court judge set some dates for pretrial hearings on October 30th and November 9th, as well as a new trial date set for November 13th, 2017. Jury selection is expected to last through the holidays, and if there are no other attorney firings or delays, the trial of the state of California versus Chase Merritt should be getting underway with opening statements hopefully coming by the beginning of 2018. I, for one, will be watching this case closely. And when it is finally adjudicated, I will be posting an update episode for you guys. So until there is a conclusion to the upcoming trial, I will bring this story to a close for now. Thank you so much for joining me for this two-part California Dreaming, The Tale of the Mixed Day Family. I so very much appreciate you all for listening. I will be following the trial and promise an update episode in the future. Don't forget to join me on Facebook on the California Dreaming discussion page, on Twitter at California Pod, and Instagram at California Dreaming Pod. California Dreaming is now very proudly a part of the Orbital Jigsaw family of podcasts, a network that brings you such fantastic shows as The Concession Stand, where host Nick and Andy geek out on all things entertainment, or Super Nerds UK, where host Ben, Ian, Tim, and Simon take an irreverent look at pop culture. Busted Wide Open, a show where Nick and Sir Ian Dangerous take you on a weekly journey through the hottest news in sports entertainment. Or Historium, a podcast devoted to the strange, obscure, or otherwise interesting stories from history. And Is This Adulting, where best friends Stephen and Chris break down the stigma on mental illness through the lens of comedy. And The Dirty Bits Podcast. Join host Tawny Plattis for her casual retellings of the sexy, scandalous, and salacious stories your history teacher likely left out and 4 one owned a show where hosts GT, Dak, Kevin, Jack, and Matt fill your ear holes with all things gaming. And Insight, join hosts Allie and Charlie as they take a new look at true crime, mysteries, and forgotten history. And lastly, Insight Junior, 
a podcast that explores mysteries, myths, and legends designed for all ages. If any of these shows sound like they might pique your interest, then visit us at www.orbitaljigsaw.com and click on their links. Also, don't forget to visit the Orbital Jigsaw Family of Podcast Merchandise Store, where you can get all sorts of California Dreaming stuff, t-shirts, hoodies, phone and laptop cases, stickers, mugs, and notebooks. You can support me and your other favorite creators by visiting the Orbital Jigsaw store. I will post the link in the show notes and on social media. Thank you again for listening to this two-part tale of the McStay family. I know it was a lot to take in, but it's a case I've been following for years now. I also, again, owe a big thank you to listener Stephanie for reminding me of this story. When she contacted me about it, I dropped everything and turned my attention back onto this case. Thank you for the awesome suggestion. I look forward to bringing you an update. Hopefully, the family sees some measure of justice. And with that, until next time, sweet dreams.